Welcome to the Dear Doc Podcast, where we will discuss the business of running a dental practice with a panel of experts. Now, your host, Dr. Christopher Hoffpower. Hey guys, this is Dr. Christopher Huffpower coming to you from my studio here in Alvin, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us again for the Dear Doc podcast. Now, today's speaker, today's guest really needs no introduction. Uh, at least I hope not for those of you who have um, taken continuing education or have not been living under a rock. You'll all know Dr. Christopher Phelps, who is one of the foremost experts in communication, both to your team and your patients. Chris, how the heck are you? It's been a while since I've seen you. Very good, very good. Uh, living in this post-crazy COVID times and just trying to find my way like everybody else. Man, I can only imagine you have not only the, the, the practice shortfalls to deal with, but also your entire career as a speaker kind of got put on hold there for a while. Um, how are you guys coping with that now? Yeah, it's like most things. It's really forced me to, well, number first and foremost, it forced me to take a, a break, <laughs> which is something I hadn't done in a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, Kathy Colby kind of says the best. She says, do nothing when nothing is the best thing to do. And yes. That was really a chance in the first couple months to shut down to just shut my brain down. And I had nothing to work on. I had nothing to speak on. There was nothing going on. And it was like a, an unprecedented time. So how it was many, a little weird at first. How many know? weeks did you go stir crazy? Oh, that first, you know, 10 days for sure. It was kind of like I needed something to work on, you know. Uh, and when I ran out of projects, I was like, oh, Lord. So I had to go back to my old distraction techniques. I was like, what did I used to do for fun? <laughs> what did I used to do to right. relax? And uh, so I rediscovered video games, thank God. <laughs> so they, they, they got me through. You know, it's just enough that I can focus on it, but it shuts the brain down so I can kind of Absolutely. relax. So, so what, kind of, uh, what kind of games do you like? RPG, FPS, MMORPG? Strategy, yeah, RTS, remember. Balloon Tower. My kids really love oh, games. <laughs> yeah, there's so many. Uh, I like puzzle games, you know, like on your phone. Uh, and I like um, on the, you know, like PlayStation and whatnot. I like, uh, you know, like Gears of War. And I like Destiny, gotcha. Destiny 2. Those kind of role-playing games. And then you can do some multi-online action if you like. You know, I, um, I just finished playing. Uh, and shout out to Dr. Glenn Vo because uh, he knew that I had played the first one. And so he bought me the second one. It's Last of Us. Last oh, yeah. of Us 2 is pretty damn good. Very, um, it kind of sucks you in. That and um, End of Days was another really good one. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of like those kind of open-ended world role-playing game, first-person shooter mismatch. I don't even know what the heck you'd call them. But that's, that's yeah. kind of my jam. What I do whenever, on the very, very seldom occasion when I play a game. I don't know about you, though. I, I kind of get sucked in. If I play, I get sucked in, and then I feel guilty afterwards because I think to myself, you know, how many hours I wasted playing a game <laughs> instead of doing something productive. But um, I, I can but only like imagine I said, you're similar. <laughs> yeah, you got to have some time to shut your brain down, though. You know, and so I kind of found it was, it was good. I needed it more than I realized. And then uh, when I could have things to work on again, then my brain was that much more ready to take them on, right? And, and things that could have been bigger, perceived as bigger challenges didn't seem so big anymore, which is kind of cool. Absolutely. So, you know, overall, I guess it was a win. So with all of this, with all of this COVID and all of the difficulties and getting things together, I know that you've put together some online courses and some webinars, and I'm going to talk to, uh, talk to you about those in a little bit. And actually, I'd love to know the different challenges you face there as opposed to in-person CE, which with you, I've been involved in a couple of those at, at this point. But before that, uh, for anyone who has been living under a rock, I'd like you to kind of give us a rundown of, um, you know, what it is you do. And, um, you know, you've got a couple of great, uh, a couple of great books out there or a great book at least out there. I think you have two, then, two at this point, right? Yeah, two and I'm working on a third. Fantastic. I, I'm still working on my first. You know, it, it's so funny. It's that whole 80-20 rule. The 80% of it goes by so fast and you go back and you, well, what if I said it this way? What if I said it this way? My editor's so mad at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know how that is. Like, Give me something, anything. That's it. So, so Chris, talk to me a little bit about um, your career as a dentist and kind of what brought you to a point where you said, you know, there's, there's got to be a better way to communicate 
um, there's got to be a systemized approach to it because that's you 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 teach something that's very nearly systemization of the communication process, which I really love because it makes it repeatable. So talk to us a little bit about yeah. where you came from as a dentist and how you kind of got into this gig. Yeah. So, you know, I started my journey, geez, 17 years ago, back in 2003, after I graduated dental school, uh, joined a dental practice that had been my wife's dentist since she was uh, 14 here in Charlotte, North Carolina, a uh, little old house fee for service office uh, that he had renovated to a dental office. Whereas in a sea of PPO providers around him, the, back in 2003, he was the only fee-for-service office around. Right. And even though his kind of facility was ancient, he only had five chairs, and truthfully, he really didn't think he could take on an associate. <laughs> mm -hmm. I influenced my way in there and, and decided I thought there was a bigger opportunity for both of us, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of an amazing ride. You know, He probably did about 600000 in collections the year before I joined him. And then that first year together in that old house, we did $1.2 together. Nice. And then opened up and or bought uh, three other offices. And over the next six years, between the four offices, got to six, over six million, six and a half million in revenue. So kind of 10 times the business in a, in a short period of time, so to speak. And it was a phenomenal rut, I'm tell you. And uh, it was kind of like one of those times where I felt like, you know, when you're in Vegas and you just, everything you bet hits and you're like, I can't lose. Right. And, and then you realize it, like all of us, everybody hits a plateau, no matter how good you are, how smart you are, whatever level you think you're at. And I got to the point with the four offices where I had, in essence, trapped myself in my own business, which is a, a challenge most entrepreneurs, especially dental entrepreneurs, tend to run into. Right. Um, you know, instead of being independent of the business and it being a true business, so it works whether you're there or not, we're slaves to it, right? And I realized that after my second son was born, and, you know, my wife was having some postpartum issues and she wasn't sleeping because she was taking care of the first kid while well, she should have been sleeping with the second one. And she needed me at home. And I realized that I did not have the margin of time or the freedom of time to help her. And so I realized between that, uh, working five days a week doing clinical dentistry, um, running the practice, running, making all the decisions, doing the marketing, everything you can think of that goes in with that balancing four offices, I, I decided I had to change. I had to get that freedom of time back more than anything. So that's kind of when I made a conscious decision to start, uh, as one of my coaches, Dan Sullivan says, subtracting to multiply. So really narrowing in on what I want to do and what I'm good at and trying to get rid of the distraction, get rid of the, the noise around me. So I sold my two best offices and, and took over my two worst ones. And uh, people think I was crazy to do that. And at the time, no, 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 know, just the project of the entrepreneur will push push the push the people to work harder and you get to see which systems are failing that way firsthand exactly you know a, a scarcity of loss and what you're missing out on and losing out on is a powerful motivator and a kick in the butt to figure it out <laughs> and not have any more excuses and do something about it right so it's kind of like you know when you have an abundance of of things to deal with or focus on or an abundance of problems it's hard to deal with any of them because you can't focus there's just too many things so when I simplified my world and narrowed in on these specific two practices and the problems they were having and how it affected me financially, I was like, nothing's going to stop. So nothing's going to get in my way, right? I'm going to figure this out one way or the other. But no matter how deep the hole I dig for myself to climb out of, you know, usually it's a, at the end, it's a good thing. That's where uh, I learned about membership plans. And I came up with that and wrote my, one of my, to actually both of the books about membership plans which I never would have done had I not sold those offices, right? That's how yeah. you know, my cultural group company got started. That's how Golden Goose Scheduling got started. Like all these things kind of developed out of my own needs and, and things I felt like nobody was really solving the problem that we had as practitioners. So, you know, I don't go looking for a problem, but when I find one that I'm passionate about, I can't shake it until I figure it out. Well, and, and that's one of the things that I've always believed. And you've, you've always been kind of an inspiration to me because I, I'm following, if not, I'm not following the same path, but very, very similar path of finding that one of my real passions is just fixing. It's like the kid, the kid in the dike, right? The kid with mm -hmm. his finger in the hole in the dike. I, I, I see there's a problem and no one else is fixing it, or at least they're not fixing it from the dentist perspective. There's a lot of people who right. attempt to make solutions for dentists who aren't dentists and they don't work in a dental office. They're just tech guys who someone told them there's a problem and they try to fix the problem, but they don't really intuitively fix it in a way that we would like it fixed. You know, maybe sometimes they think the problem's one thing and it's a different thing. And so I think that you've done a really good job with that. Um, for instance, um, your Golden Goose Answering Service, which um, 
full disclosure, I have no financial interest in Golden Goose, but uh, I have used them and um, I've used several different answering services. And I did find that Golden Goose just had the highest quality answering and the highest quality whenever it came to actually converting patients in my fee-for-service practice. And um, you guys do a lot of good there. You really, really do. Um, so that's just kind of one example of a service that you've built that it really addresses it from what we need rather than what a programmer thinks we need. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. of course, a lot of that can be because of bad communications, which, uh, which kind of naturally segues us into communication. So you've, you built these practices, you wrote these books. Along the way, you became a, um, a student of Cialdini. And yeah. um, what, so what led you to that? What led you to first to influence and, and then beyond? So what, what was it that made you pick up that book to begin with? Or was it something different than just that? Yeah, you know, it was, I, was, I actually heard Dr. Cialdini speak at an event where he was the keynote speaker in you know, some kind of entrepreneurial meeting. I don't even remember which one it was. And because uh, at that time, I was just anybody that was speaking about business and I had a big name, I was going to go travel in here because I felt like I could learn more lessons from other industries that we could apply to our industry as well. You know, without having agree. to read you know, If it kind of worked for them, I bet their problems are similar to our problems. So just looking for new perspectives on things. And it was right after I'd sold my two best offices and took over the two worst ones, uh, one of which the offices hadn't grown in three years, had been producing the same. And the other one was a cold start office we had started that was, you know, bringing in uh, 35000 a month in collections. Mm-hmm. Uh, here it was 10 months in, but it was costing me 70000 a month in expense. So, you know, not a good check to have to write every month. <laughs> uh, so, but I couldn't put my finger on why this other practice wasn't growing and why was I struggling with this cold start office when my first cold start office I did, did a million its first year and two million the second year. So right. it was like a tale of two cold starts. Like why was one crushing it and why is this other one failing all of a sudden or not succeeding like it should. And you know, the, your brain is really amazing. It, if it cannot identify the root cause of the problem uh, or if it doesn't think it has the capabilities to handle the problem, it does two things with it. It ignores it or it procrastinates on it. You know, and it got me to a point where I couldn't do either of those anymore. I couldn't ignore it and I couldn't procrastinate on it. So when I heard Cialdini speak on his six principles, there was one in particular, that consistency principle, where I was like, ah, that is the root cause of the problems that I'm seeing right now. This guy is an expert. He knows what he's talking about. This is, and it's based in science, right? So it's not somebody's opinion. Right. It's not somebody's anecdotal evidence. Well, it kind of worked over here for this practice. So I think it might work for you. No, no, this is, you know, study after study and why people do what they do. And I've always been a student of behavior anyway and interested in why people do what they do. And I thought, all right, I want to learn from this guy. Uh, So I went out to Arizona and did his two-day persuasion workshop. They do it once a year out in Phoenix, Arizona in July, (laughs) the hottest time of the year. And, uh, And I just fell in love with it. And then I found out they had a certification program and applied and got accepted, did my training, and just kind of spent the next three years using my two practices as my laboratory to put Cialdini's principles into play and say, look, if, you know, if it, if it worked in this study in this way, I bet I could apply it in a similar way in my mm-hmm. practice, and I should see similar results. And we did. And, you know, we t- went from 1.6 million in the two practices combined uh, to three years later doing over 6 million, you know. So a lot of growth when you understand – why people, what are they really using in the moments leading up to in the moment they're going to make a decision. And when you start communicating to that, everything changes. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to ask you, and I, I always warn my guests before I bring them on that I'm going to have a question. I'm going to ask you to give the audience a give. I want you to give them two or three different techniques that when they're, when they're speaking to people, they can really do a deep dive on. Before you do that, I want to point something out. Over time, a lot of this stuff simply becomes second nature. Earlier, and you taught me something years ago, and I don't know if you remember this or not, because it was a huge thing for me, but it's probably not a huge thing for you. You just kind of mentioned it offhand. I said something about a failure and said, no, it wasn't a failure. It was a revision. Do you remember that? Yeah. I remember. That sounds it. Yeah, <laughs> because I use it every day. And a couple of seconds ago, you said failing, I mean, not succeeding. So you kind of, you flip the script on that with yourself 
because whenever you think of something as a failure, you've lost and it's done. But when right. something's just not succeeding yet, it's not over. We, we, have, we can fix this, right? Yeah. And so I think that's one of the important things that goes along with your training is that it forces your mind to think in a different way that frankly is healthier and better for you as a practitioner. Because we as dentists tend to be very self-effacing and self-judging and self-hating. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that's one of the most healthy things that people get out of your courses is they, they leave with maybe a different way of thinking about failure that allows them to not be a failure. They're just not successful yet. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. Well, you know, every failure is just a breakthrough waiting to happen, right? Absolutely. It's all a matter of if you're determined and motivated to figure it out. I mean, what I've kind of learned in life is there's very few things that I can't figure out a way around or have a good, create a solution to. Or if I can't do it myself, then if I spend enough time researching it, I'll find somebody or a group that can help me who has that solution or a way around it. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Too many times as dentists, we just get a barrier, an obstacle in front of us. And we're like, oh, well, I guess I can't do anything. What am I going to do? You know, and then we turn inward and get more negative on ourselves, beat ourselves up for not having that capability. But the truth is, is like I said, all we need to do is just look around it and say, no, this is just a, a temporary setback. Let's maybe our system isn't working. Okay. And I do that a lot with the team. I say, look, you know, every frustration just means we need a better system. So let's just figure right. out what's wrong with this one. There's no judging anybody. It, it just sucks. The system, playing the system. And let's figure out a way that this all works for us moving forward and we don't have to deal with it anymore. You know, well, and I like that you, you talk about how you bring your team into that too, because you can't, you can only progress so far until you find a way to scale something. And one of the problems with dentistry as a way to build wealth is that dentistry is not a scalable industry by and large, because I need to use these to make money in most cases as a dentist. And so I can't, say, oh, hey, Jolene, you're an assistant. Um, I want you to go ahead and place that implant for me. But we can scale ourselves in taking those CEO skills, like we need to make a new system, and putting that to your team, allowing them to do all the grunt work and then bringing it back and refining. And I find that that helps a lot in my practice where I say, hey, there's a problem. You came to me with a problem. Do you have a solution? No. Well, go think about it. Come back to me with a solution to fix this problem, we'll work on together. And that tends to keep people from complaining and it forces them mm -hmm. to actually think through the problem before they bring it to you. But whenever they make the solution and they make the procedure, I would say they're a hundred percent more likely to adopt it than if I just arbitrarily go in and say, okay, we have a problem. I'm going to solve it. Here's the solution. When they work on it and you put that out to your team and the way that you said we work on it together, it makes them feel included. And when they feel included, they're going to actually follow through and implement whatever the solution was that you came up with. So, yeah, you know, that's a perfect example of, uh, I talk about from an influence standpoint, the old adage, when the cat's away, the mice will play. Right? It's a, everybody's heard that. And, but I don't know how many people have actually thought about that, what that means. And it's really the difference between when you influence and persuade someone versus if you coerce, intimidate, or force them to do something. Right. right? And it all comes down to choice. And if people don't feel part of the process, if they don't feel like they have a choice in the matter, then they're not committed. And you know, you're just telling them to do stuff. It's the cat, it's the threat, right? And so when the cat's around, the mice will do what you want. But when the cat's not around, guess what they do? They play. And I knew to get that freedom of time that I wanted and try to make myself independent of the practice, I had to empower them to be able to take on ownership of stuff and do stuff without me coming to me for every little thing they needed decided on. You know, and uh, you know, giving them the leeway and that choice and getting them involved with the process, like you said, giving them guidelines. Here's the end result. I don't care how we get there. I'll leave that up to you. Bring me your system and maybe I'll tweak it. Maybe I won't, but I'll leave it up to you guys. Let's figure this out together. And so we're, we're all going to get there. So Chris, do you think that, I'm trying to think of how to say this in a way that's not going to hurt people's feelings, but I'm just going to say it because, you know, I just, that's never been a huge thing for with me anyway. So do you, how big of a failure of leadership do you think it is when the dentist feels that they need to be the solution to every problem? You know what I mean? They, they don't push yeah. anything out to their teams. They don't allow anyone else to make any decisions. They have to micromanage everything. Is that a failure of confidence in your team? Is it a failure of leadership? What would you think? What, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, truthfully, like I said, I don't like that word failure because failure implies intent, right? right? And that would mean if somebody failed as a leader, that means that they knew how to influence and persuade their team to get stuff done versus just telling them to get stuff done, right? And then they chose to do the latter. They chose to just tell them. Right. To me, that's a failure, right? When you intent, you knew what you were getting into and you chose a different maybe, path. Maybe on. it's not, maybe it's not that they didn't know. Maybe they simply didn't know the how. I think that's what it's more of. It's more ignorance of not knowing how to influence people, right? Mm -hmm. Not knowing how, how to get people to do things in a way so that when the cat's away, the mice don't play. But if so, they knew, then it's an easy path. So talk to me a little bit about the first steps to being a better communicator um, with your team. And then we're going to talk about being a better communicator with your patients so that you can give them what they need to hear so they can say yes. Yeah, definitely. And I think the, the first steps you got to do is remember, we got to get in the habit of giving people choices. Okay. Uh, not too many choices because, you know, the paradox of choice is the more choices you give them, the less likely they are to pick anything or focus Absolutely. on anything. But what I want people to get good at is my first tip for you is the better you get at presenting things as a this or that scenario, the more influence you're going to have. Okay. And they call that uh, the remote control phenomenon. And mm -hmm. many of us men can probably relate to the remote control syndrome or phenomenon. Meaning in our household, if you're sitting there at, at home watching TV, where does the remote control sit? Who controls the remote control in your house? Well, the For guy. most of us, if you're like me, right? It's us, right? Now, I know mine sits right here on my little shoulder. So if I want to change the channel, I can just boom, grab it, change it, put it right back where it belongs on my shoulder. It's like my little pet. Mm -hmm. right? And if my wife has that remote for more than like 30 seconds, I start to get twitchy. <laughs> and I'm looking at her like, God, is she going to give that back? What's going on here? You know, crap, I've lost the power. I've lost the remote. That's it. Yep. And it ultimately comes down to something everybody feels, but men more in particular, is it's a control thing, right? We have to feel like as humans that we can control something in our world. But unfortunately, the reality for most of us is we're in control of very little of our world, okay? But guess what? It's one thing I can control, this freaking remote control. Where does it sit? Who lives it? Who, who owns it, so to speak? Yep. So it, it comes with control. And when you go to a team member and you go to a patient, like let's say a patient, you say, Mr. Jones, you need a crown. You're telling them, right? In essence, you just took the remote control right out of their hands. Yep. And that guy's like, who the hell are you to tell me I need a crown? This is my remote. I'm going to take it back. I'll be the one that decides when I need this crown. No, thanks. Now, they won't tell you that, but in their head, that's what they're thinking. And they're just going to smile and wave and say, I'll think about it. I'll get back to you. Okay. Versus if we go to them and say, Mr. Jones, you got a, two choices. Number one, you can do nothing, but here's what's going to happen. Two's going to fall apart, root canal, build up crown, whatever you want to say. It's going to cost you more time, effort, money, pain by waiting. Or we could get this done with a crown today and take care of it for much less. What do you want to do? But when we present choices, now we're giving people control. Absolutely. Right? Control their destiny. Now the trick with influence is we're controlling the choices. That's how no. we're guiding them where we want them. But the better we get at presenting things of this or that, the more influence you're going to have. So I have, I actually have a story about something I put into effect here. Um, do you remember, I think it was two and a half years ago, I sent you a piece of paper and I said, this is what I'm going to use to present dentures to my patients. And basically it had, I was, I was using the price staircase yep. and I called one of the dentures something that I stole from you. I called it the your choice denture. Do you remember that? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Chris, I kid you not. That was the highest seller. And I, I yep. even actively tried to steer people away from it after a while because it got to be, it was, it was a CONUS, uh, CONUS system, which I, I've had some mixed results with. And after a while, I was like, eh, you know, we really don't want to do this one. But they were insistent on the your choice denture. And it just all had to do with the fact that it was in the middle of the price stair. And it was where I had originally intended them to, to fall because I presented their fixed, which I didn't really want to do fixed at the time. And I presented the conus and I presented locator and I presented crap, which is, you know, denture with nothing. And mm -hmm. so no offense to any dentists out there who still make traditional dentures and think that they're amazing. You're wrong, but <laughs> it's okay for you to have a wrong opinion. So anyway, it, it's so funny because even after I tried dissuading them from making that choice, I would say a good 60% 
of the patients chose the your choice denture. Yeah. Because the persuasion built into the piece was so powerful. It was, and it's think like you said, it, right? They're just autopilot. They can't help it. So when we, we like to think that our patients are making an educated decision and I don't care how good you are at explaining what they need. Okay. You can show them all the x-rays, all the pictures. You can go through almost as much detail as you want to give them about their dental situation. But because these people are not dental experts, right? They don't know what we know. Not really. Unless they've had it in their mouth or have gone through it before, they really right. have no concept of what you're talking about. So they're, we think they're using our logic to make a, a decision when in fact they're not. They're looking for other things. And that's why these principles kind of come into play, like a choice. Because what they're thinking is with these, the fixed option, I don't have a choice. It's got to stay right. in. But now with this conus, or I call it the, the Deutsch removable bridge, right, right. is another version of that. Now I have a choice. I can leave it in or take it out. Hmm. Which would I prefer? Adrian, no choice? Does, Adrian does some of the most pristine work I've ever seen. Really? Yeah, really. I mean, it's that's, that's my choice of that thing. But, and, uh, right. but again, now the patient goes, do well, I want no choice or a choice? I don't know what we're talking about, but I'd rather have a choice. So I'm thinking of changing fixed to freedom so I can push more people up the price stair to the, to the fixed. So we'll see how that works. I'll report back. <laughs> I like it. So your first step, is making sure that patients have a choice and making sure that they make the choice that you want them to make. So let's talk about how we use language to move a person in a direction or away from another direction. And I think, and here's the really funny thing, I think it's so common sense that most people just simply don't use it. I guess they, they, they start trying to think like a doctor instead of like a person. Because when you started talking about this, my brain just went, oh, crap, I knew that already. Why haven't I been doing that? So go ahead and talk about the language usage and how you, how you push a person in one direction or the other. Yeah, and, and first, again, go back to intent. My intent is, and my contrast choice for myself is, I think the patients are either going to do something or they're going to do nothing. Right. And all I'm trying to influence is that they do something. Because the worst thing they can do is nothing. But the problem exactly. with the way we're presenting is there are more people are choosing nothing, right? So, you know, I'm not necessarily trying to, on purpose, push them to a certain procedure per se. I'm going to present options and I'm going to get, I just want to get them to say yes to something. Because as long as they leave in better oral health than when they came in, then I feel like I've done my job, right? Okay. Even though I may not agree with it, even though, let's say they choose a partial denture to replace a missing tooth. All yeah. right. It's not the best, but it's better than nothing. Right. So as long as they leave with something, I'm happy is my goal. But I also know the way I structure this influence presentation because the influence stuff is more power. So powerful. It sets the stage that they are going to want now the, your ideal procedure. Exactly. And if they want it, then they're going to figure out a way to get it. Right. So it kind of works into your advantage. And ultimately our next big uh, tip for you guys is whatever you want to talk about, whatever you would like to do more of this year, procedure wise, you have to understand that you cannot start your presentation with that thing. You have to anchor them to something else first, then talk about what you want to talk about. And usually what we're going to anchor them to has to be of a higher value, it has to be a higher cost in money, time, pain, something that that person values, which is why every one of my treatment presentations, even if there's only one option in my mind, like doing a crown, there's always two choices. Option one is do nothing, but here's what's going to happen. And I lay out all the consequences and how much it's going to cost them in time, treatment, and what they value by waiting. Like that crown, do nothing. And we're going to do a root canal build up in a crown down the road, more pain, more time off of work, and probably $3,500. Or we can get to it today and do this crown for much less. What do you want to do? So before I talk about the crown, I got to anchor them to something else first. And mm -hmm. it's always got to be a higher value because of this, the way we make decisions in the moment whether it's a yes, no, or whatever it is, is we're comparing and contrasting the available information in front of us to, to decide, right? And so when you just present one thing in front of them, people are always going to compare that one thing to something in their life. So if I said, you know, Mrs. Jones, you need a crown and that's $1,200. Instinctively, she's going to go, holy crap, $1,200. Damn, my car payment's not $1,200. That's more than my house right. payment. I can't afford that. And when you let them control the comparison, we lose. Because suddenly we got a mental no. She said, I can't afford it because she's comparing it to the thing she's spending her money on. Right. Versus if we change it up and we control the comparison and anchor them, 
to the root canal buildup in a crown for 3,600. Now she's thinking, holy crap, I definitely can't afford that. Oh, but it sounds like that's not where I'm at. Oh, we're only here at this crown and it's only 1,200? Oh, that's a lot better than 36. Okay. So I call it, it, the door to yes is either shut in front of you in your presentation technique or you left the door to be t- potentially open. And now the patient has a chance to walk through. So but either way, that contrast works for you or against you to keep that door open. Absolutely. So on the way here, you've talked about a couple of different price anchors or um, experience anchors is what I kind of like to think about them as because pain is one of them. Uh, sure. So one of the things that you do that I think that a lot of people don't do is they learn more about their, you, you learn more about your patient before you ever see them. And you ask them a yeah. series of questions. Hey, what's most important to you in order? Um, not being in pain, cost of work, quality of work. And, and yep. then you know where their anchor is because they tell you what their anchor is. Whatever their right. most important thing is, is what it is. You also ask them if they're proactive or reactive. And I think that those are huge things. So can we talk a little bit about that patient interview process? And I think it's going to shed some light on just why this technique is so powerful. Yeah. And this was something that Dr. Cialdini's uh, last book he wrote, Presuasion, really opened my eyes to and just how powerful this asking these questions before the patient gets to you is. Because it ultimately, it comes down to the person's mindset. So, you know, I talk about the five main reasons why people say no to you. Uh, in that moment, but mindset is a big one. And, and whether you realize it or not, your patients walking in your practice are coming in with a mindset, okay? It's already established. And if you do nothing to change that, that mindset is either working for you or it's working against you. So imagine a new patient sitting in her car 30 minutes early for her new patient appointment. She has a knockdown, drag out fight with her husband, tears, maybe a divorce is coming. It's, it's bad, right? She hangs up, but she's here for appointment. She cleans herself up. She comes in, has an okay experience. And you come in talking about all of her dental needs. Where do you think her mind is right now? Is that door to yes even open or has it already been shut in your face? No, it's, it's, it's no, she's still on the, yeah, she's still thinking about that fight in the car, right? So her mindset is not even here. How many times are we talking to our patients and they're not even there? Not really. Okay. And their mindset is elsewhere. And it's all and about focus. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not that big of a threshold either. It can be anything no. because remember, dentistry for most people is something they don't want. And so right. almost everything trumps that. So it doesn't have to be a divorce. It could just be uh, my daughter has a paper due at school that's late. I- anything can trump dentistry. Anything. <laughs> in fact, most things do. So what I've realized is, and what we talk about in the persuasion course, is there are things you can do to retrain their mindset, get them recentered back and set the stage for a yes. So by asking questions like, hey, when it comes to your oral health, do you prefer to be proactive or reactive? Suddenly it gets them back to a mindset of, huh, what do I prefer to be? Huh, proactive or reactive? Again, I don't care which one they choose. I just have a strategy based on the decision. And the things they answer and the the things they tell me they value, as you mentioned, I'm going to tie that back to their treatment in my presentation because I know it's front of mind. It's top of mind. And it's going to have a lot of impact. So that would be my next thing. Be very wary about what mindset they're in. And your mindset is shaped. uh, We call it, it's who you are in the moment you make a decision is about where you are in that moment. Where you were physically, meaning the sights, the sounds, the smells you experienced leading up to your decision. uh, Mm -hmm. Where you are emotionally leading up to the decision. And where you are cognitively, like what are your thoughts dwelling on? So if we do nothing to change their mindset, we've already got the door to yes slammed in our face. (laughs) And we got an uphill battle. Absolutely. So one of the things you talked about earlier and we kind of fleshed out is finding an anchor. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I had the most interesting experience and I've actually, since learning about all this stuff, I guess I kind of remember how many years ago with the first time I I took one of your courses was, but um, since then I've done some experimentation myself and I found that you can actually anchor a price to itself whenever you have a special. So yeah. let's say implants. My usual cost for an implant with crown is anybody who's listening to this, I am not colluding with any other dentist. This is a disclaimer. So my normal price for an implant in a crown is about $4,700. I'm sorry, yeah, $5,700. So what I generally do is I will call my labs and I'll say, hey, 
who wants all my implant crown business this month? Okay, what are you going to offer to do my implant crowns for? All right, great. You're the lowest so far. I'm going to call a couple of more people. I'm going to call you back. Believe it or not, that works, people. Call your labs, negotiate your prices. It's phenomenal. And then I'll buy a bulk of, let's say, I just bought a bunch of neodym, about 75 neodym implants. I got an amazing price on it because I bought bulk. So then I will run a one month special and I will say, I bought 50 implants. First 50 people will get this price until it's gone. And then I print up a little paper that says, this is the normal price. This is what you're getting for it. You are number X of 50. All right. When I hand those papers out, this is a little tricky. I put one through 10 at the back. I start at number 11 because I want to build some urgency and I want to build some fear of missing out. Um, I know we, we are, I'm not using child eating terms here, but I know you're going to explain it in child eating terms in a couple of seconds. And so what I'll do is I'll drop that price to $3,000 all inclusive includes everything except for extractions and bone grafts. And I anchored my new price to my old price. And so whenever the people hear the new price, they react exactly like whenever I'm walking down that price staircase and they say, that's the one I want. I want to do that. You know, oh no, I don't want to cut down two good teeth. I, I, I want an implant. And so I've made the decision easier for them by creating a price anchor. I've put scarcity into it so that they are afraid that they're not going to get it. Um, obviously the authority and everything else, I've got all these diplomas and CE hanging on the wall and pictures of me shaking hands with important people and yada, yada, yada. All of that goes into that final process, but it was interesting to me to find that you could anchor a price to itself when you were offering a sale. So talk to me a little bit about that. Maybe some of the things I'm not thinking about that I'm doing that's making this work um, and explain to our audience how they can do this for different procedures and, and different, different things in their practice. Yeah, I mean, uh, anchoring is key. As I said, we have to start with that before we want to talk about what we want to talk about. So it just comes with, once you know the ideal procedure you want to present, you got to back it up and say, what is a higher value? What is a higher thing? Sometimes, as you mentioned, you can anchor them to your normal price versus a discounted price. Uh, I've anchored people to other people's prices. You know, um, you know, in our area, we have a clear choice center, you know, 20 minutes outside of town. And my hybrid fee just happened to be 20% less than their hybrid fee just by accident. I didn't know that. But once I found that out, I started marketing it. Why pay, you right. know, 20 grand over there when you can pay 20,000 over here, save 20%. And I got more people who had been to clear choice, like what they heard, but didn't like the price. Suddenly with my 20% discount in their mind, uh, we're biting at it and jumping at it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I, one patient one time, um, she was interested in my zirconia hybrid, which is 34,000. That's like my highest procedure I can do. Right. And that's what I used to anchor my titanium hybrid and then everything else underneath. Well, I knew she was interested in it and she just point blank asked me, she was like, all right, doc, how much is this one right here? And she was that kind of patient. Like normally I don't talk about fees with the patients, right. but uh, I knew she wanted to hear it from me. So I happened to remember a conversation I had with a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Andrew Turchin, who's up in Aspen, Colorado. And he does the same procedure I do. And he charges 64,000 for that same thing. And I charge 34,000. So I was laughing and I was like, dude, that's, I wish I could get 64,000, but I'm not in Aspen, mm -hmm. Colorado. My patients are millionaires, right? They're not coming right. for these ultra high aesthetics like yours. So I just happened to remember that story. And I said, well, Mrs. Jones, when she asked me how much it was, I said, you know, I was just talking to a buddy of mine up in Aspen, Colorado, and you know, he charges 64,000 for this procedure. And I saw her eyes go like, oh my God. I was like, yeah, that's a lot of money. But you know what? We're not in Aspen, Colorado. We're in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I only charge 34,000. And automatically I saw her go, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Suddenly it opened the door to the possibility of getting a yes now, right? Absolutely. Instead of being shut. So you can anchor them to other people's prices. Uh, the whole key is, is to anchor them to something that they value. And there has to be a higher cost of what that value is. Some people hate going, I hate to say it, but some people hate going to the specialist or another office. So sometimes I can just anchor them to going to other places to get the work done. Right. And I can't. Right. If we wait versus taking care of it now. And, and that and is that's so important. Anchors, anchors do not have to be money, guys. They don't have to be monetary no. at all. It can be inconvenience. It can be pain. It can be not wanting to do something different. People in my town, 
they don't want to drive 10 miles. Like that's, right. it's like you're asking them to cut off their left hand. <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and, and that's a real powerful thing for me. So, well, and the key is using that new patient form to ask those questions to find those anchors, right? That's Absolutely. how we discover what they value and what we can anchor them to. It's all in the new Absolutely. patient form. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the principles that you teach. Um, so I'm going to miss some of them. I, I've gotten to the point where I, I use a lot of them and my team will call me on it. And they'll say, mm -hmm. oh, you just use scarcity. <laughs> And it's really kind of cool to see that they, how they're looking for it because they're learning it. So we've got authority, we've got mm -hmm. scarcity, we've got, um, oh gosh, authority, scarcity. Oh, what is the one that mirrors bandwagon approach? Social proof? Consensus. Social A consensus, proof. Which, which he originally, if I'm not mistaken, called social proof and then changed. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so... So what am I missing? So we are liking, of course. Liking. Um, we like to do business with those we like. Reciprocity, like. that's as old as time. Absolutely. Uh, and consistency. Oh. And that's the one that was my big Let me see if I have this on me. So I just did something. I think you'll love it. When patients walk into my practice right now, and this, again, shout out to Glenn Vo. I bought these. Uh, Glenn owns a company that prints these masks. So... I walk out into the reception area, which is a big thing, guys. If you're a doctor and you take the time to say hi to a patient, it's a big thing to them, even if you're not seeing them. And I'll say, hey, I like your mask, but how'd you like one of these? They're really pretty. And they'll take it and they're like, oh, thank you. And I've just done reciprocity first thing whenever they walk into the practice. Now everything else is just downhill because I've already done something when they feel like they owe me. So something I've just started doing with COVID, you know, and um, instead of giving them goodie bags too, we're doing this now. So it's just, we give them a mask, we'll give it to them at the beginning of the appointment and the rest of everything else is, is easy. And if I'm not mistaken, you kicked around the idea a while back of giving out goodie bags before the appointment. I don't know if you ever started doing that or not, but that's where I got well, the idea. Yeah, yeah. Like I'll do that. Um as a referral technique. Like I would get my patients when they agree to refer someone to the practice, I'll give them a goodie bag to hand off to that potential new patient on my behalf as a gift. And there'll be some gift cards and some other things in there uh, to set the stage. Now let's go back to choice. Cause again, I told you it was important. So right. here's how you can amplify the results of what you're already using reciprocity for. Okay. Okay. And right now you're giving people a mask and you assume they value that gift. Now most do. Okay. But not everyone will. Right. But, and they're not going to like say, no, thanks doc. Right. right. <laughs> they're not going to be mean in the moment. So you don't really know. And that's the problem with giving a gift is you're assuming that they value it, but if they don't value it, there's no power there. Not really. Absolutely. Versus if you added one choice to it and said, Hey, let me, I, that's a great mask. I'll tell you what, I got an option for you. As my gift to you, here's a mask or some hand sanitizer. Which would you prefer? My gift. Love to it. You. And if they say both, great, take both. I don't care. But it, when they pick one, now they pick the thing that means the most to them. Now you've just elevated reciprocity to a whole other level. See, this is why I interview because I always pick something up new that I can use. <laughs> <laughs> I, and it goes back to what we've been talking about. Choice is key, right? Even one, one option. That's for that. What, do, what would you prefer? Okay. So uh, let's, cover, let's cover the five principles, right? Yeah. So reciprocity, right? You give a gift of value. People, this obligation is created. They feel like they need to give back. And truthfully, they want to give back as soon as possible. It's like something on their to-do list. And they actually prefer for you to give them a chance to reciprocate right in that moment so they can scratch it off their list. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, liking is probably the most overlooked in dentistry, but it's hugely important to build relationships. It's, uh, you know, we like those who are like us, who have similarities, commonalities, connections with us. We like those who like us and tell us or show us. Um, and we like those who cooperate with us. So liking is big, okay? And we want to do business and, and say yes to And that spreads like. to your team too, folks. Don't hire people who don't have a great personality. You can train skills, yep. but you can't train a personality. No. And again, if, you know, no one has ever missed cutting out of cancer <laughs> in their practice. And everybody feels it, whether they say it or not, right? So you've got to have people that are willing to, at whatever level. And we're not even talking about extroverts and introverts here. I mean, I know plenty of my team members that are introverts that make great connections with my patients. 
As right. long as they, they make the connection with the patient, I don't care how they do it. That's what, that's really what's important. So we like those who like us and, and have connections with us. Uh, social proof is the, we look to others to show us what we should do, uh, especially in COVID in times of uncertainty, if others are doing it, Oh, maybe I'll be safe doing it too. Right. So we really want to, that's what Facebook is built off this whole principle. Absolutely. And, and all of you older doctors or younger doctors for that matter, who don't think that reviews are important, you're imbeciles. Ooh, I'm going to yeah, say it right now. True. You're an idiot. It's so well, especially now, right? Because again, the, the risk tolerant crowd that are actually flooding our offices right now uh, are actively looking online for a dentist to get into somewhere, right? Absolutely. They've been reactive for too long and then they couldn't get in to see somebody and now they're freaking out. So these are like my favorite patients because they're, they're, my treatment plan is how much can I get done today? And it's always a yes. <laughs> yep. Okay. So if you're not getting reviews, you're not going to be in the search rankings. It's like free advertising. You got to get it. And plus you can leverage that social proof in so many ways in your, in the, in the practice, in, the, in your advertising, et cetera. So Absolutely. big stuff. Of course, authority, as you mentioned, is we look to credible, trustworthy experts to tell us what we should do because truthfully, we don't have time to be an expert in everything. Okay. Um, this one has kind of lost a little bit of favor over time, but I think the pendulum is starting to swing back. Uh, but people are having a hard time discerning who's a true, credible, trustworthy authority. Right. right. And of course the social proof out there, it's like, do I believe this expert or what people are saying on Facebook, my friends? So mm. at the risk, at the risk of giving away some of my secret sauce, we have a town Facebook page of over 50,000 people. Mm. And so every week on Tuesday, which means today, I'm doing it today, I go onto the Facebook page and I say, hey, this is Doc Huffbauer from Winning Smiles. And every week I put myself out there to give you free advice. If there's anything you've ever wanted to know about dentistry, no question is stupid, ask away. Yeah. And guess what? Yeah. Who do you think the authority in my community is? You are. Again, when you put yourself out there and people start looking to you for answers, even if they don't need you today, when they do have a dental issue, they're going to, you know what, that one doc was on here. He's always got good answers. Doesn't try to sell himself. He's just educating. Right. That's a nice gift he's given. And that's given. important. You know, Super important. That's where I'm going to go. Yeah. You're not promoting anything. You're just here to answer questions. It's interesting. This last time that I did it, um, I, had, I had kind of fallen off the bandwagon with, um, with COVID. And so I got back into it and I said, hey, guys, I'm so sorry. I'm a screw up and COVID kind of messed my world up. So I apologize for not doing this for a while. And it had 190 responses, 190 questions, and it remained at the, the top of the page for several days. So I had a physician call me. In fact, I just got off the phone or my team just got off the phone with him today. And he said, I didn't know any dentist knew anything about sleep apnea. Can I refer my patients to you who are intolerant? I said, absolutely. And so I'm going to have lunch with him next week. I'm going to drive up to meet his group. And I got business from another referring practitioner because they saw that I cared enough about a patient base that isn't even my patient base to give people accurate, good information. Can't stress enough how much authority is important and how easy it is to be an authority. Yeah. And again, when you go look, look to where people are hanging out, right? So on your community Facebook page, uh, next door is another great platform. Uh, if you have that in your area where people are just talking about in their community, in their neighborhoods. And if you can start blogging, I call it blogging, right? If you start putting yourself out there and just being available to answer people's questions unbiasedly and not promoting yourself, <laughs> you know, it's, it's called grassroots marketing, right? It doesn't cost you any money. It just takes some time, but the dividends you will reap is some of the best marketing you'll ever do. I, I completely more. agree. Okay. Yeah. So we've covered authority. Yep. And we got consistency, which I mentioned before. Uh, that one I call the commitment principle. That's all about if you get somebody to make a real commitment, then if you ask something that falls in line with the commitment or stand that they've made, it's hard for them to say no. Yeah. So our challenge in the industry was, and, and this is why I kept wondering, why aren't my patients showing up for their appointments when they said they would? Why aren't they paying their bill when they said they would? Why didn't they call me back to schedule treatment when they said they would? Why didn't they refer? Mm -hmm. Why didn't they do the review? Well, my harsh reality, my aha moment was discovering that I actually did not get a real commitment out of them to do it. Right. So no wonder they didn't fall through. And once I started getting better at getting the right kind of commitments from them, everything changed. Okay. For my team, for my associate doctors, for my patients. Okay. 
And, and so and we I talked about three types of commitments you got to get. You know, we talked about one, voluntary commitment, which is mm -hmm. you got to give people choices, right? At least two options, this or that. Uh, that way, if they choose one, they felt like they had a choice in the matter and they didn't feel coerced or intimidated into it. You got to get active commitment. So they got to tell you they're going to do it. They got to write it down or they got to uh, yes. put money into it. You know, putting a deposit down is the highest form of an active commitment they can do. But even just verbally telling you they're going to do it, they're more likely to follow through. Writing it down means they're even more likely to follow through. Uh, and then, of course, it's public knowledge. So this is why I want, like, everybody in that operatory that I can squeeze in there when I'm talking to my patients about their treatment. So everybody in this room knows what you said you valued and what you said you were going to do. Right? So public commitment. We are really influenced by what uh, the people around us. Okay. And so if everybody knows we said we were going to do something, it's going to be very hard for us to not follow through and do what we said we were going to do. Okay. So we've got to get more public commitments out of people as well. So one of the things that we do or that I did that I, I have some new team members who I haven't personally trained in sales and um, they came from other practices. And um, I have a thing I say that um, training, not titles empowers people. Mm -hmm. Because titles can say, you know, all this, but you really only know this. Right. So this person did a lot of things and does a lot of things well, but they were a treatment coordinator at one point. And she has a hard time closing sales. She doesn't know a lot of these simple techniques to talking. Uh, for instance, a lot of times I'll listen and I'll walk past and I've corrected it several times. And she's going to be going to your course, by the way. Um, yep. is she'll be talking to the patient and they'll say, um, well, I need to go and talk to my wife. And that's the end of the conversation. Well, okay, we'll be here for you. No, that's not the end of the conversation. <laughs> so <laughs> that's one of the things, one of the areas I have to train her in, but it's also in keeping appointments. And one of the things that I do that I don't know, I've never seen anyone else do. Basically, I will say whenever I'm getting them in to do an appointment and I'm the one making the appointment. I'll say, hey, go ahead and take out your cell phone. So they take out their cell phone. I'll say, all right, go to your calendar. I've got this day and this day free at this time. Which one of those is best for you? Mm, nice. So I've made them commit to taking their phone out of their pocket. They're not just going to give me a yes or no. They've actually expended some energy in it. I've made them actually look on their calendar to see because guys, a lot of people, a lot of what they're telling your team, if you don't listen to it, you need to. You need to hide behind a corner and listen to what patients are saying. Don't correct it. Don't and jump in, but know what you're fighting against. A lot of people will say, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know when I'm going to be free again. They're lying. They have their cell phone on them. Almost everyone in the entire world keeps their calendar in their cell phone. So they just don't want to commit to an appointment. And so if you ask them to get their cell phone out first, they're going to feel a little bit sheepish about lying to you whenever you ask them to open their calendar. And so they're going to actually commit to doing that appointment because they've got the calendar in front of them and they don't want to sit there and lie to you whenever it's right there sitting in their face. Now I know that's probably a, a horrible bastardization of the things that you teach, but um, I find that it works in my practice, just making them commit to taking that cell phone out and open up their calendar. So well, good and or bad, what do you them think? <laughs> I mean, again, you're giving them a choice too. Hey, I got yeah. this time or this time. What day works best for you on these days? So again, just giving a simple, instead of just saying Tuesday at two, nope. Wednesday at four, nope. That's not a choice. Well, and don't, guys, when you're talking to a patient, there's different things you can say that don't have completely disastrous effects. Can I make an appointment for you? No, no, you can't. You never can make an appointment for me, no. So, for your next appointment, we have this and this. I know you usually like the afternoon, so I've got this afternoon and this afternoon free. Which one is the one you'd like me to fill out? Or which one would you like me to put you down for? You never ask if you can make an appointment for someone. It, nobody wants to be at the dental office, people. <laughs> I can't stress that enough. Yeah, you uh, never ask questions you, you're going to get. You could get a no to. <laughs> exactly. If you can help it. Absolutely. So, yeah. what is uh, We've got about four more minutes. And um, do you have any one just shining star piece of information, huge tip that you don't want them to leave here today without? 
Uh, well, again, if we're probably we can tap into the last principle, scarcity, right? And scarcity is about, true scarcity is about when resources are limited or running out, it motivates you to want it more, okay? Like if the oxygen in your room where you're sitting right now was disappearing, most of you would probably prefer to know that and do something about it before it runs out versus when it yes. runs, right? So the problem our brain has is it can't discern true life or death scarcity from I'm standing in line in Starbucks and there's only one banana loaf bread instead of six in there. Now I want banana loaf bread, right? So it still motivates us no matter what, okay? Which is why so many people try to use it both in an unethical way and an, un and an ethical way against us. So, you know, one of the ways I use scarcity goes back to that treatment and it's all in that anchor. That's what the anchor is. It's a scarcity anchor and focusing on the consequences of what's going to happen if they don't do anything and laying it out for them in treatment, what's it going to cost in treatment? Root canal build up in crown instead of a crown. What's it going to cost in, in money? 3,600 bucks instead of 1,200. What's it going to cost in other things they value? More pain, more infection, more, more visits, whatever. So remember, you know, it's always my first option I present is do nothing, but here's what's going to happen. And you lay out the scarcity because if people really knew what we knew was going to happen to them by waiting, if they really understood it like we did, most people would prefer to not let that happen to themselves. Absolutely. Most people prefer to make it a priority and figure out a way to get it done. Unfortunately, the way we're communicating, we're slamming the door to yes in our faces more times than we can count. And, and doctors out there, when you're thinking about, when you're telling them about what happens whenever they do nothing, think about a patient who did nothing and think about the yep. complications that they had. There, there's so much power in nonverbal communication when a patient, when you say, well, you could do nothing or this and this and this and this can happen, and you're actually thinking about a patient that you know that you regret that they chose to do nothing, believe it or not, you have micro expressions on your face that are going to influence this person to not want to be in pain the way that other person was. And, and I think, honestly, just giving someone an authentic, real life example of something that happened in your practice is very powerful. Definitely. And again, you got to believe it. If you don't believe it, then you shouldn't be saying it. Absolutely. But if you really believe it and you know what's going to happen because you, right. you've been trained and it's going to happen. Should, right? but my it's point good. is it should never be a script. Right. You know, because we get used to saying these same things. My, my assistants joke and uh, they'll say, you know, that's like the 30th time I've heard that joke, Dr. Huffpower. <laughs> because for every time I tell it to a new patient, it's a new joke for me, right? Yeah. You have to be in the moment. And you have to be really thinking about an actual patient who these bad things happen to. Because if you're just saying, well, you know, if you don't do anything, your, uh, your tooth could split. And then, I mean, you know, best case scenario, you have to have a root canal and a post and core and then a crown. And, you know, worst case scenario, you may have to pull the tooth. That wasn't really compelling. Now, if you say, you know, you can do nothing, but I, I had a patient I, obviously, I can't tell you their name. They chose not to do anything. We ended up having to do a surgical extraction there. And we had to do a bone graft and an implant. It was months that she went without a tooth. And she was in a lot of pain before she came in. So I just want you to know that's what can happen if we leave this on the course it's on right now. Now, your other options are we could do a crown right now, you know, and just think about it and be authentic about an example that's actually happened in your practice or one that you know about. It's just a very, it's just very powerful communication. Yeah. And, and real quick, my last tip for everybody is this. So, and it goes back to the commitment principle. So when on the whole, when people don't follow through and do what they said they were going to do, normally we call those inconsistent people liars, right? Flip floppers, flakes. But the reality is the behavioral science shows us that they're not really intended to be liars. It's just, they got distracted by a thousand other things. And in their mind, they think they're going to get to it at some point but it gets pushed down so low on the priority scale, they're never gonna to get to it. So one of the things you can do to help influence them after the fact is to remind people of the commitment that they made. Yes. So from a review standpoint, we give them a choice. Hey, would you do a review for us? Sure, great. When you do that, are you gonna use your phone or are you gonna use a laptop or a desktop? Because you know, if, if you send my mom a text link to do it on her phone and it's not gonna happen. But if she can do it on her computer, if she's got instructions on how to do it. So I wanna give them a choice first. If they say whatever they pick, then I had my team screenshot and go through and do a review on both mediums, on the phone versus a desktop. And they screenshotted every step of it and we wrote out written instructions and they leave with a piece of paper that says, okay, when you go to do this later, here's a step-by-step -step instructions with pictures on how to do it. 
with your phone or laptop or desktop. Thank you so much for doing that. So when they put that little piece of paper on their, their kitchen counter every night and they, every night they come home and they haven't done the review and they see that paper, what's it going to remind them? They said they were, do, they were going to do. Yep. I, I was Get actually thinking of a question to ask you, but you just answered it right there. And it's the reminder. I was going to ask, why don't you send them an email with the instructions and a link or a text with the instructions and a link. And you're right. They're going to sit, they're going to sit it on the counter. They're going to see it. And it's going to remind them. That's, that's kind of brilliant, Chris. I love it. If it's gonna, if it's on their phone, it's gonna disappear, right? You'll, yep. in a, it'll be buried in a sea of other emails and texts. But if it's on physically in their hands, they're gonna see it, and it's gonna remind them of what they said that you're gonna do. And you're gonna see even more people do reviews than you ever saw before. Well, Chris, I think we've covered a lot of ground here, and you've definitely given them a whole lot of pearls. Uh, as always, I love having you on the podcast or just interviewing you on a live because, or just getting to hang out at the bar because I learned so much from you every single time. You make me really kind of think through the things I'm doing. And um, of course, since you're better at it, it I learned something. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us here today, but not before I do make one plug. Uh, folks, uh, Chris has very generously um, created a, a less expensive alternative to in-person CE. Uh, for several reasons, one of which is COVID. But um, we have that posted on the business of dentistry. And um, if by any chance you mentioned to him that it was from TBOD, I'm, I'm sure he'll do something nice for you. I have, I'm putting him on the spot because I haven't negotiated anything with him. So he'll have to use his imagination. He'll probably give you a choice between two things, like maybe a mask and a goodie bag. <laughs> I'm, implementing, I'm implementing that tomorrow, by the way. You can guarantee it'll be a choice. <laughs> that way you get do, what you want. I can either give you the CE credit or I can allow you to watch the class and give you the CE credit. <laughs> real presents, well, yeah. real gifts, folks. Right. So, be Chris, real, be good. as always, thank you for, uh, for coming on to the podcast. And if they haven't seen the post, I have tagged it at the top of the business of dentistry. And um, all they have to do is click the link there and they can sign up. Is there anything else that they need to know? Uh, no, I'll, uh, I'll think about uh, what the two uh, uh, little goodies I can provide uh, for anybody that wants to join us for the live stream of my persuasion workshops and the one day persuasion workshop I have coming up. But yeah, we'd love to have you. It's great training for you and your team. Uh, to me, it's critical. It, um, everything is a wasted expense if people don't come back for treatment. And if they leave more times doing nothing than doing something, Everybody loses. Yeah, there's no, ROI, there's no ROI without a patient getting treatment done in the chair. None at all. No. On anything you spend. You know, you could be the best clinician in the world and do all the CE to make, get your hands and skill to the, the elite level. But if they don't come back for treatment, it's still a wasted expense. So absolutely, got to focus on communication. Well, guys, you have spent another hour of your life wasted listening to the sound of my voice. I sure want to thank <laughs> you for joining us for the Dear Dog podcast. And um, Chris, thanks again for joining us as a guest. You guys have a fantastic weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Dear Doc Podcast, your source for the business and legal questions associated with your dental practice. Don't forget to subscribe to the Dear Doc Podcast on all major platforms.